I know that having met many of you, I know that you are all tenacious and you've been involved in this for a very long time. And I think I was very encouraged to hear the speeches of my colleagues in both the Senate and the House of Commons. And I'm very grateful to my fellow colleagues in the Senate and MPs who unanimously, both in the House of Commons and in the Senate, the bill was passed unanimously. And I was very fortunate that my member of parliament from Dartmouth, Darren Fisher, sponsored the bill in the House of Commons. And many people in their speeches stood up and said that they had never heard of sickle cell before they had heard the speeches or before they had been asked by their party to speak on the bill. And so, as you know, Canadians celebrated the first official National Sickle Cell Awareness Day in 2018. And I was in the House of Commons when those speeches were made on the House side. And it was interesting a number of them stood up and said, my party asked me to be the representative and to speak on sickle cell. I'd never heard of it, but I did research it. And this is what I found. And of course, our group is going to be supporting this bill. So that was really interesting. It was also interesting to hear one of the MPs who had been in a, her prior life, a nurse in Senegal, and how she had had uh, administers to patients with sickle cell disease. And then it was also very interesting when one MP stood up and said she had the sickle cell trait. And I'm sure that none of her colleagues had even known that until she stood up that evening to speak on the bill. And I tell the story of this legislation for two reasons. One is to remind you that the outreach and the advocacy that you do day in, day out in your community, for your local level of government, for your provincial governments, and even the federal government, they do have an impact. That you don't always notice it right away, but you do have an impact. And two, just remember that progress can be slow. It can be very frustrating. It was very frustrating to me. Sometimes you face have setbacks like an election being called unexpectedly, and it can be frustrating. Be tenacious. Uh, remember that you're, just remember how far that you have come in 10 years. You're you're always making steps forward. I see it. I look at it from a different perspective than you do, but I see the progress that had been made. You have tenacious advocates uh, within your organizations, provincially and federally. And sometimes when you look at it from outside the political system, you can think what is going on, but it, it is making a difference and educating people is a key component of that. Uh, and and remember, worthwhile changes always take a bit of time. So when it comes to the discussion of sickle cell awareness, particularly on Parliament Hill, I must acknowledge the great Jean Augustine. I'm sure many of you know Jean. In 1997, she was the first person to talk about sickle cell on Parliament Hill and to highlight how little sickle cell was known. And the health minister at the time was Alan Rock. And to his credit, he told Jean that he had never heard of sickle cell. He didn't know about sickle cell, but he came back to her a week after she had spoken on Parliament Hill to tell her that he had gotten a full briefing on it. And, and kudos to him for doing that and coming back and telling her. And kudos certainly to Jean, who continues to be an advocate. And it was Kirsty Duncan from Ontario who helped to inform me of sickle cell. And there's another advocate who doesn't give up. So the conversation that started with Jean Augustine continues today to mark National Sickle Cell Awareness last June, June of this year. The Senate's African Canadian group hosted a parliamentary information breakfast, which I was pleased to attend and pleased to speak at. And it wasn't unlike the one that I attended first year. The MPs and the senators that I spoke to after that breakfast were affected in the same way that I was at the breakfast in 2013. So I'm really encouraged to know that the conversation on Parliament Hill continues and that there are more advocates both in the House of Commons and in the Senate to continue that journey. So as we start to put the pandemic behind us, I hope, fingers crossed, um, I've had the opportunity to start attending sickle cell awareness events again. Some continue virtually but many have been held in in person and I certainly recognize that this is a good time to hold them virtually. And I had a great, the great pleasure to attend the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario's annual Hope Gala and Awards Ceremony earlier this year. And that always gives everybody an incentive, an incentive to continue on this, this battle. 
I was also invited to attend the Sickle Cell Anemia 2023 conference hosted by the Interdisciplinary Center for Black Health and Sickle Cell Disease Association of Canada, which was held at the University of Ottawa. And I mention these two events because on those occasions, I was reminded again of how strong and vibrant the sickle cell awareness community is becoming. And after two, after two years of the pandemic and isolating at home, there was always the fear that advocacy would diminish and involvement would decline, but that is definitely not the case. And you see it when you attend these meetings. Success, successful advocacy relies on strong voices and strong support. And it also depends on people not giving up, just continuing the fight. And those of you who are here today online are those strong voices, the strong voices for families, for communities, and for Canadians. And I know for advocates to be successful, that they have a, a large community behind them. And telling your stories and encouraging support builds momentum and that results in change. I've been fortunate over the years to meet with so many Canadians who provide that support and I see the strength here today. As I wrap up, I want to express how grateful I am to everyone who is here today. You're here today to raise awareness, to share your knowledge, and to support one another. And I would also like to thank the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario for organizing this summit and inviting me to be here today. I'm always humbled to be attending these events when I see so many Canadians and families living with sickle cell and hearing about the challenges that they face. And my hope is that awareness will continue to motivate decision makers to advocate for sickle cell the sickle cell cause. We've come a long way since I started my journey in 2013. There's still a lot to be done. But when I see the people who are, who are on Parliament Hill to celebrate sickle cell awareness this year and who are attending this summit today, I know, I know that we are blessed with advocates who share your passion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Cordy. Um, I, I, I mean, I couldn't have said any better myself. I really appreciate those, <laughs> those opening That's words. That's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dumbfounded, honestly. It was a great, great session. Thank you so much. And I, I want to make sure I give enough time to your, your co-panelist, Dr. Sol, to also deliver uh, his remarks. So uh, over to you, Dr. Sol. Yeah, thank you so very much, uh, Delaney and and Tuscago for for having me. It's really such a huge honor, and not only to be here, but to to share the panel with uh, with Senator Jane Cordy, who's been such a staunch advocate for for our our cause. And uh, it's it's really interesting to hear her perspective from the beginning to the end, um, and the ongoing work. Um, you know. 2018 being the first uh, sickle cell disease awareness day of June 19th uh, really is it was also my first uh, my first year as as an advocate for sickle cell disease as, as a hematologist I started in 2017 and and I think I remember Laundry asking me to uh, you know help advocate for the 2018 you know um, very first inaugural day and I hadn't realized how much uh, history that that day had I, I've realized it over the years. It's really wonderful. Um, I'm glad my my slides were able to to come up on on the screen. Um, yeah, so I've been asked to 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 talk about a, a topic that's extremely near and dear to my heart. Something I've been uh, living day in day out for the past uh, seven years that I've been at um, at London Health Sciences Center and at Western University. Um, you know, Senator Cordy spoke about all the amazing work they've done on on the governmental level. Um, in the hospital, it's it's a it's a completely different environment, and I hope to shed some light to everybody about uh, the struggles and the um, the the amazing people we work with, really, in the hospital, but also the struggles we all face together collaboratively in in an environment um, uh, like like a hospital. Um, so my topic is physicians' advocacy role and empowering people with sickle cell disease within the hospital. Um, I'll I'll uh, I'll have you um, uh, so so I'll I'll let you know that we, when we started in, in London Health Sciences Center in in 2017 uh, there was no sickle cell disease clinic it was 
um, patients were going to, to general hematologists who were trying their best to follow the guidelines, but we knew we needed um, much more infrastructure than, than, than a physician. We knew we needed excellent nursing, excellent social work, um, um, you know, guidelines within hospitals, and those were things that were were lacking. So it was it was my honor to start the clinic in uh, in uh, uh, late 2017, and it's really grown. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about how how we were able to to grow it and all the connections we were able to make within the hospital. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there we are. And I really would like to frame my my talk. I only have a couple. So don't worry. I really would like to frame my talk around um, the four four pillars that we learn about in medicine, uh, four pillars of medical ethics, and how we we as doctors are um, really uh, trying day in day out to uphold these pillars and and keep them front and center when we advocate for patients, when we treat our patients, when we have discussions with our patients, when we have discussions with our uh, with our administrators in the hospital, our colleagues, etc. So, you know, under the the roof, I would say, of dignity, our patients' dignity and and honest and honesty overall, we uh, go by the four pillars of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Autonomy is really respecting uh, your patient's right to self determination, and we know this is um, this has been a barrier for our patients for 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 some years, and we're we're getting there. You know, things can um, can impede autonomy, um, like uh, structural racism and other things, which uh, which we need to fight. Beneficence is really the duty to do good. Um, so any any decision we make, it's got to be a good one that's going to benefit our patient. Non maleficence, it's a very fancy word, but really what it means is you know first do no harm. That's the first uh, thing we learn in medical school. Don't harm anybody. Whatever you're going to do, just make sure it's going to be uh, either the least potentially uh, harmful option you have, uh, or just don't do not do anything bad. And then finally, which is uh, I think something we talk about all the time uh, in within sickle cell disease is justice. So treating all people not just equally. Sometimes you can't treat them equally, and you shouldn't, because equitably is the better word for that. Equitably meaning, you know, if one patient uh, one patient's needs are higher than the other, then they should get more care than than someone who needs um less who, who has le less need so as i talk through uh the next slide I, i'll we'll keep those four pillars uh in mind and we'll we'll, we'll talk about how how we can uh, keep them front and center so areas that are me as a physician uh, and my my physician colleagues have have worked on um are are the following so um and I'll just ask everyone to mute their microphones if that's okay. I'm just hearing a bit of an echo. Um, so the, the keynote speaker discussed this very nicely, actually, and, and they were talking very much about, you know, creating safe spaces for our patients, ensuring that uh, patients feel, uh, feel safe. Well, the hospital is a space that our patients have felt unsafe in for, for many, many years, because, you know, in 1997, uh, uh, you know, folks uh, in government hadn't heard of uh, sickle cell disease, and they've um, they've um, learned a lot over the years. Sickle cell disease patients have been in Canada for for decades, um, so the hospitals have not felt uh, very safe for them. So one of the first things physicians can do, and we in at London Health Sciences have done successfully, uh, thankfully, is working with uh, other physicians and other environments in the hospital to create that safe space. And what that means is. When our patients come to the emergency department, we listen to the to them. And many of my patients had said, you know, all these doctors that tell me they don't know what sickle cell disease is, they go on their phones and they Google it and they're trying to find out, you know, what's the first thing they should do, what's the second thing they should do. Um, and that's fair because uh, you know, physicians um take care of hundreds of conditions, if if not uh, you know, many more than that. And uh, sickle cell disease is just one of them. So the way to, to combat that um, that gap in knowledge is really creating uh, creating um, standards of care that were non-existent, uh, that are probably not existent in the majority of our hospitals. Um, I think academic hospitals have done really well because they try to uphold those those standards, but many many hospitals still have uh, 
uh, work to do. And we do collaborate at London Health Sciences. We collaborate with our, our regional hospitals that see less sickle cell disease to ensure that their emergency departments have, um, uh, you know, are creating safe spaces and safe practices for their patients. I think uh, Senator Cordy had said, you know, physicians were, you know, the, the, the voices of patients were saying that my physician doesn't know what sickle cell disease is. And certainly that's what we were hearing as well. Um, and then even things like uh, when our patients often need surgery, uh, we were finding that the uh, uh, surgeons were um, understanding the importance of, uh, of um, uh, or understanding the significance of sickle cell disease and that it's, it's, uh, patients can get really sick. Uh, but there was um, a need for support from a, from a hematologist like myself or creating standards in the operating room that are very unique actually for sickle cell disease. So this is where you know, a condition like sickle cell disease may, uh, may receive other standards of care that are actually inappropriate for sickle cell disease. So a physician's role in advocating for their patient is actually to, to say, uh, are my patients very unique and very different? And I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to do this, uh, you know, prepare your patient for surgery completely differently than you're used to. And I know you don't know what that means. Here's a list of everything that's been published by the Canadian Consensus Guideline that uh, physicians in the past uh, have worked on, namely Dr. Madeleine Verhofsik, and um, and that we're updating now. Um, even things like pain. So we all know that one of the hallmarks of sickle cell disease is excruciating pain. You know, debilitating pain. They our patients miss work. They miss school. Uh, they stay home for days. Um, and then to add to that, they show up to the emergency room, and and the physicians, um, are, you know, are are uh, you know not able, not comfortable giving the the large doses that are are appropriate uh, of of pain medication. So really advocating with anesthesiologists and chronic pain experts and acute pain experts. Uh, so that's all. I mean, imagine starting from scratch with these discussions with all of these departments in different areas of the hospital. It is it is a, a lot of work, and uh, you know the sickle cell disease physician does need to devote time um, in their schedule and and in their priority list for for this. Um, and even things like radiology, these are things like X rays and MRIs, and so there is a lot higher need for for these interventions that are expensive um, to get prioritized. So we can't have certain imaging. Um, you know, scheduled for a year from now. You know, we have waiting lists of a year for an MRI. Um, but we can't, we can't have that happen for for our patients because they will, you know, we're we're screening them, we're testing them for for prevention reasons, not not just uh, not just non non electively. Um, other things are, you know, physicians have to make sure that they they're well aware of is, um, you know, it might seem simple. Uh, but we often don't have clinic space. So, um, you know, these are, you know, clinic is a very uh, precious thing. Uh, like uh, the rooms in the clinics are very highly sought after. So if, uh, you know, 10 physicians uh, require uh, clinic space and we have Monday to Friday, that's it. <laughs> We've got five days of the week that are actually work days. Um, and, you know, we shut down Saturdays and Sundays. So, you know, those clinic spaces are very precious. And, and us as, as sickle cell disease physicians have to advocate to, to get that clinic space. And what's working against us often is that, um, uh, you know, we're working in a hospital. This is a corporation, right? They, you know, the four pillars that I showed you of medical ethics, um, you know, they may not be the same pillars that, that a corporation in, in business really, really, uh, prioritizes. So when I when I spend one hour with a patient uh, versus another doctor can spend an hour and see 10 patients, um, that's not good for the hospital for me because they will they they would likely be less interested in in advocating for for me to get more clinic space, more clinic time to see more patients. So we have to be very creative. We've we've switched to video appointments often so that we don't have to rely on a physical room. Um, is that good? Is that bad? I think we have to make sure that we we do enough research in the area to to ensure that virtual visits are not a bad thing for our patients. Often they're good, especially with our you know cold weather. 
in Canada, we don't want our patients getting out of their house and waiting for the bus in the cold and getting a pain episode from the cold exposure. So we have to we have to be very creative and advocate on many levels. Um, I do want to also talk about um, you know we we talk about prevention and treating our patients' symptoms, but there are many um, other options now uh, for cure, complete cure. And this is a dream for many of our patients. They they don't want to deal with sickle cell disease complications and pain and the daily changes in their lifestyle that they have to adhere to. So here is often, you know, a stem cell transplant or gene therapy. It's a very exciting time now, and we need to make sure, you know, Health Canada is, is approving uh, these, these uh, not only the studies to go forward, but, you know, once something is proven to work, we need to make sure it becomes easily available. Um, so curative therapies are, are things we we talk to our patients about, unfortunately, um, because of, you know, specific medical reasons, only about 10 or 15% of our patients are eligible for some of these curative therapies. So uh, we, we are stuck with, with prevention um, for, for many, many patients. So when I say curative therapies, it means, it often means we have to uh, ensure that our hospitals are, are able to have stem cell transplant programs. So to have a stem cell transplant program, it's, it's uh, it's advocating on many, many fronts, even the laboratory. So the lab has to be able to process these stem cell products. And um, we have to have stem cell doc, stem cell transplant physicians that will do it. So more collaboration, whether it's at our own center, which luckily now London does offer um, sibling transplants uh, for sickle cell disease. Um, in the past, we used to have to send them to, to other centers, which was very inconvenient. So this took years to, 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 to have available locally, and, um, and it's very exciting. Um, so as often advocacy is, you know, it's you know, to, to see the fruits of your labor, it takes years, right? It took, took us many years to get here. And what Senator Cordy was saying about persistence and, you know, you got you to gotta be somebody who's going to be um, not giving up easily. There's going to be many failures along the road. That definitely rings true. Uh, we've had the doors shut on us many times. We just make sure we, we prop them open anyways. And to get to these curative therapies, we have to be able to open clinical studies. And this is uncomfortable for some people. This is like a, a shot in the, in the dark. You know, it's evidence-based, but clinical studies are where we don't know the true benefit of something, but we want to try it and see if we can open new new doors for our patients. And, and so we, uh, and to have, to have a trial open at your center, you need research personnel and you need to, to, to have a research center that, that is willing to you know, hold funding for them and, and, and deliver it to, to the research staff. And um, again, rooms for patients that are devoted for research. And so it's really advocacy on, on so many fronts um, to, for our patients. We have five minutes left, I believe. Um, this is, uh, the human resources clinic staff piece is is its own talk, really. And I, I really want to thank um, Ms. Laundry and Scago for, uh, and as well, the their, their collaborators in the Thalassemia Foundation advocating for uh, clinics across the province of Ontario to, uh, to receive significant funding to hire um, allied health staff. So we're talking, you know, essential members like social workers, um, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, because um, you know if if you don't have multiple physicians able to, to participate in the clinic, um, you know nurse practitioners are actually extremely effective members of the team that we're you know we're, we're looking at hiring. Some some clinics have physician assistants. Um, we even even um, you know secretarial support. You know our patients call with many questions and they forget their appointments sometimes. So. Uh, the, you, we need funding for even those roles. Um, so, um, you know, Scago has been able to really advocate and obtain that funding and it's ongoing funding. And I think, you know, London and all the, uh, a lot of the sites that are attending our summit today are, are indebted to, to, to this advocacy effort that, is, uh, that has been uh, taking place. This also involves, um, you know, uh, vice presidents of hospitals, you know, signing that we need this funding, you know, this is the educating them who are extremely far removed from the bedside, but they they need to hear us out and, and realize this is a need. Um, 
we have to show them our numbers. This is how many uh, emergency room visits. This is how much uh, death, unfortunately, has happened in sickle cell disease, both on the pediatric side and the adult side, for them to really hear that this is a, an important need and, and write that letter to the Ministry of Health um, asking for, for funding. Um, we, we are also working as physicians. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we all collaborate uh, on uh, endeavors like creating a national registry. So we get asked, how many patients do you have in, in Ontario with sickle cell disease? And oftentimes it's difficult to answer that question accurately without a, a registry where uh, actual uh, patients are, are identified. And, you know, um, so we are working with collaborators across the country on a national registry as physicians, principal investigators, and as um, uh, as allied health as well. Uh, we're also working on creating national practice guidelines, which I mentioned in, in the uh, at the beginning of the slide. Um, we also, uh, physicians often can uh, and are usually invited to sit on equity, diversity, inclusion committees within hospitals to fight the anti-racism and anti-black racism. Uh, so this is something I've done, it was very rewarding and really bringing our experiences with and, and the patient voice uh, to these committees make, makes such a big difference and helps with advocacy. Uh, one thing that's a bit controversial is sometimes our patients uh, have negative experiences at the hospital and you know we will advise them to you know, please speak with our patient relations office at the hospital to voice that concern you have and we're finding that uh, our patients are often shy and they don't want to cause, you know, cause that kind of attention. Uh, but, you know, sadly, that's what it takes. You know, you have to, uh, so our, our role as physicians advocating for our patients is often, here's the website for the patient relations office. Please, you know, um, write your complaint, you know, um, as respectfully as possible or, or well, doesn't have to be. And you know this is the only way, sadly, that the hospital will will uh, will listen to uh, true patient patient voices. So, uh, you know, the physician uh, advocacy role there is educating patients about resources for them to be um, to for their voices to get heard. Because telling me is very nice, but telling uh, other other parts of the hospital that have more clout on on real change um, is 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 more effective. And finally, I wanted to mention that we, we, we in London and I think other hospitals, I, I think, you know, we learned from the Hospital for Sick Children uh, that we can do patient education sessions. So we have been doing uh, Saturday patient education sessions where we take a topic that patients often ask about and we get all of our patients together with their families and parents and children. And we sit down over some food and talk about, you know, how, how do we go about a stem cell transplant? Or what is a pain episode? Or why is fever such a, uh, such a, um, a high risk thing to have? What, what should you do? Um, and oftentimes, you know, discussing it in clinic is not sufficient because uh, they may not be, have the opportunity to ask all the questions. So doing it in this venue, you know, outside of clinic hours, outside of office hours um, is always nice. And it's, uh, you know, we see, uh, we see a lot of our patients as, as friends over the year, really, over the years because the chronic condition and we, we really get to know our patients. So this is just a small summary, I would say about, you know, the physician's role in empowering patients, the physician's role in advocating within a, a hospital or, or a, a clinical space that's, um, that's uh, often not felt to be as safe as it could be for our patients. Thank you so much for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Sol. I think your first slide really resonated with me, the the need for more ambiance around those central tenets of medical ethics, to your point, dignity, justice, non-beneficence, those are things I think need to consistently be front and center for many of, of our providers providing care for those with sickle cell disease. And I think it's really a, a great primer for the conversation you led us through. So thank you for that. And folks, we've now entered the question and answer period. So. I know you've been all been waiting with bated breath to uh, pose your questions to both Senator Cordy and Dr. Sol. So now is the time. Um, we do, however, have oh one question that's come through on 
feed loop. It's for Dr. Soul. So maybe I'll, I'll take that question first. I can pose it to you. Um, this comes from Michaela. Dr. Soul, is it the hospital physicians who provide weekend education session for patients? Um, so I'll preface this by saying, um, you know, weekend uh, education sessions are, are um, something, you know, grassroots that, that people um, opt for. Um, so the way we've, we've done it in the past is, yes, it's physician led. We bring the pediatric and the adult hematologist together. And often there's an invited speaker from, let's say, anesthesia or someone else. And before COVID, we even had the laundry from Scago attend. and um, and um, uh, But our nurses are there and our, our social worker is there because often the questions are a bit multidisciplinary for, for our allied health as well. But yes, it's usually physician um, led. Thank you for that, Dr. Sol. Uh, Ms. Lenry, I see your hands raised. Go ahead. Thank you, Senator Kurdi and Dr. Zoll for that uh, impactful presentation and advocacy, being multi-pronged approach. Uh, my question to um, first to Dr. Ziad Zoll is how can we ensure that more physicians are involved in sickle cell advocacy. For some of them, uh, they might not be comfortable. They might feel that that is for patient organizations to, you know, to do, and their job is just to treat the patients and so on. But we know that uh, we are all a part of a puzzle, and we can't do it alone. Uh, we have to work as a collaborative. So how do we encourage uh, or get more clinicians to be involved in advocacy? And that's for Dr. Zola. And then I have a question for the Senator Cordy as well. I'll let Dr. Zola go first. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alonri, for that question. It's it's a difficult question because advocacy, I think, you know, you you as advocates, you know, probably all know that it, it comes from within. You know, it comes from, of course, your experiences with the disease, but um, um, you know, it, it comes from within. And the way the way I've uh, been able to um, recruit uh, advocates uh, from from within my network is. Uh, around cases like if there was a really difficult case that someone was involved in and they felt um it didn't go as well as as we'd like how can we do better um the amazing thing is you know often they are the ones that are um th that are um you know seeking more knowledge right so they um you know in medicine we have something called the lifelong learning so when you when you're stumped by something and when you feel you didn't do well it's on you to to learn about it and and do better next time. So you know, it's around cases that I've I've found our emergency room colleagues have have uh, really become interested in advocating for sickle cell disease. You know, we we created a an order set in the emergency room uh, to ensure every patient that walks through the door gets the same standard care every time. That was an emergency room physician that that. Uh, that helped me through that because I didn't know the emergency uh, room environment and the contacts from within. So uh, it was really case-based. Um, we we also uh, incentivize them by, um, uh, you know, collaborating closely on research. So if we say, you know, we've noticed a problem, uh, you know, we've had about 20 patients with sickle cell disease in the emergency room who, um, uh, you know, who've had really long waiting times let's do a quality improvement project and put a number on that. Um, and they're really interested usually to, to say, okay, how many hours did our patients wait? Why, how can we fix it? So that becomes a quality improvement uh, project uh, way of advocating. Uh, within the hospital, quality improvement is, is, a huge, uh, is a huge part of what we wanna do. Thank you, Dr. Sol. And Dr. Uh, Senator Kurdi, I wanted to thank you again for your impactful presentation. And I want to echo some of what you said, because I remember in 2017 and 2018, when we were working to get uh, June 19 enacted as the law in Canada, many of the parliamentarians had no clue what to say. And it was very interesting uh, when I was watching the, you know, some of, some of the sessions when I, I realized that they have gone to research sickle cell and they were actually, you know, debating uh, and, and they were very knowledgeable at that point. And it's like, wow, we've gone from 
night to day. And people are talking about sickle cell, the symptoms, how it affects this population and what we all need to be doing. And that was so heartwarming to see so many parliamentarians getting to, you know, no sickle cell disease. So I would like if I want to commend you because you made Canada to be on the world map where sickle cell is concerned because we're the only country in the world, only country in the world that has enacted June 19 as a world sickle cell day. And we, we're not the country that has the largest number of, of patients. We only have about 7,000 or less in the country. But we have raised a tremendous awareness and done a lot of work and sickle cell disease. And that's because you had a big heart. You had empathy. You wanted to be a part of a change. You wanted to support a marginalized community. And for that, we're grateful. Now I want to ask you, for we know the population in this country keeps growing, more immigrants are coming in, and the needs, everybody has different needs, so many rare diseases and so on and so forth. How do you think at the federal level that sickle cell disease can continue uh, uh, to be visible and that we can continue to make changes and get policies uh, that will be favorable uh, and support this population? At the, at the at the federal level. Thank you, Senator Carr. Uh, that's a really great that's a really great question, and I, I have to comment on Dr. Soul's uh, presentation. And I I look back at when when I first got involved in it, and people were, were saying at that time that there is no cure, and now we're talking about um, curative therapies. And I know it's only ten to fifteen percent, but that was not even on the table many years ago. And the National Registry, it was the same thing. I know Laundry was battling to have a National Registry at the time. So it's sometimes good to look back and see what's happened because sometimes when you're in the middle of these battles, you think, are, are changes really happening? Are, are we really making a difference? And so we've come from not many people in Parliament knowing about it and, and no National Registry and talking about no cure for it to, to where we are today. Lots still left to be done. But I think that we sometimes have to uh, step back and say, just in, in what medically is a short period of time, how far that we've come. And thank you, Dr. Soul, for the tremendous work that you do. And to your question, Lonre, I think it's really important that it always stays on the, the center stage in, in Ottawa because there are always competing, conflicting things that are happening in the life of a parliamentarian. Um, and, and, don't be afraid to phone your MP or your senator or your MLA and all of those names are easily accessible online. So if you're from Ontario or Nova Scotia or Quebec or wherever you're from, you can easily get that information and you can get maybe not the personal cell number, but you can certainly get an office number and email so that you can get in touch with people. And, and that's really, that's really, really important. Um, and it, not everybody is going to jump up and down and say, oh, yes, I really want to do it. But you just have to find a few advocates. And I mentioned in my remarks about the Senate's African-Canadian group, and they hosted a breakfast on Parliament Hill for Sickle Cell Awareness Day, and they were kind enough to ask me to speak. But there wouldn't have been that many. The, the number of people in this advocacy group now who are willing to move it, things forward, there would not have been that many people in Parliament who were even aware of what sickle cell was if you look back 10 or 15 years ago. So the group has reached out to me to find out what to do. And I'll just I'll just name the names, but I can certainly give the list to you, Lonre, also. So from Ontario, we have Senator Rosemary Moody, who is a medical doctor. She's the chair. We have Marie-Francois Migy from Quebec. She's a medical doctor. We have Amina Gerba, who is also from Quebec, who is young and energetic. Wanda Thomas-Bernard from Nova Scotia, a friend of mine and in our group in the Senate, who said to me, if there's anything that I can do, let me know. Uh, Mubina Jaffer from British Columbia, um, Ontario Senators Bernadette Clement and Sen Sharon Bury, who's also a medical doctor. And from Newfoundland, we have Senator Revalia, who is also a medical doctor. So there are lots of medical doctors, but there are also non-medical doctors who are really interested 
they've joined this group to look at put this group together and they came to me and said we are going to organize this on Parliament Hill, which is terrific that you've now got a lot of advocates within the Senate. And there were a number of MPs there that day who again are at, can be advocates within the Senate, within the House of Commons. Um, so just um, the nice part about when it's the Senate is that elections, um, you know that they're going to still be there in a few years time after an election and they can also help you during an election. Many MPs would be hesitant to take the time to be presenting at a conference during the middle of an election. So they are, um, I, I guess it's just to say don't be afraid to reach out and sometimes if you haven't reached out to senators or MPs you can be a little bit intimidated. For me I, I was the oldest of eight kids. I grew up in Cape Breton. My dad worked at the steel plant so you know what they're not most people who are in the Senate and, and MPs are come from very humble backgrounds so just phone their offices and talk with them. I mean, thank you. Senator thank you for that response. You're right, Ms. Landry. I, I had a question queued up, but I think she's already answered it. Um, you'll see, folks, we've, we've populated the poll. So if you wouldn't mind submitting your responses, that'd be great. Um, and I don't want to end the Q&A that quickly. I, I had a question myself. So I'm hoping folks can multitask. But um, mm -hmm. so, Senator Cordy, is it OK if folks, you know, broker a connection between those that list of names saying that you sent them? Sorry, you want, I'll send them. I, I will send them to Lonre and uh, I don't have your email address, but I do have Lonre, so I can send them to her. And those names are, are um, they don't mind them. I mean, it's it's public that they are Perfect. involved in this group. So uh, they, it, you know, if you phone one of them, you know right away that you've got an advocate. So, you, so that should not be at all intimidating. Beautiful. It's just like that. It's that simple, right? Just pick up the yep. phone, make a phone call. Beautiful. Yep. And then uh, Dr. Saul, just before we, we let you go, I had a quick question about medical training. To your point, you know, a lot of it happens during lectures when it's preclinical years, and then you enter the wards as a, a clerkship. So I'm, I'm wondering, like yourself, how can you implore your colleagues to model the advocacy behavior that you display so well? Um, yeah, so, you know, in medical school, um, you know, sickle cell disease is, is, is under a huge umbrella of anemia, right? So it's not re really, uh, you know, front and center in, in day to day, um, uh, cause you know, the complexities of medicine, but, um, there is, uh, I believe now there is a curriculum focused on, um, you know, um, anti-racism where we feature cases of sickle cell disease um, so if, if physicians are part of a medical school they can get involved in these lectures um, you know I even insert sickle cell disease in my in my transfusion medicine teaching which is a completely separate area I work in but there's a lot of transfusion uh, in, in sickle cell disease and blood needs and special blood needs and rare donors and all that so it's really finding areas within within day-to-day -day education of medical students where, um, where sickle cell disease can come up. Uh, but there's definitely a curriculum in, in many medical schools that teaches anti-racism. And, and these cases are, are very uh, helpful, sad, but, but these are the, the cases we learn from. Beautiful. And then Senator Cordy, uh, I guess one final question to maybe close out the Q&A session. I'm not seeing any other questions come through from the audience. I'm actually just going to do a, a final check. But from your, oh, I lied. There is one question that just <laughs> come in. Okay, so um, it, it reads, how to teach, how can we teach to be an advocate during medical training is also being recognized as an important gap. Currently at U of T, we're trying to develop this for hematology training. Sorry, so more of a comment than it is a question. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that comment. Um, so yeah, back to you, Senator Cordy. Uh, with, with respect to the milestones you've helped you know, achieve at the federal level, um, what's next for you? <laughs> <laughs> tough question. Good qu yeah, that is a tough question. I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but good question. But just uh, if you mean in relation to sickle cell, I, mm -hmm. I just hope that it's continuing in this journey. And I think it's also um, talking with 
definitely i'm no different than anyone else i i look at the people who have put their names forward as being part of this group to as advocates for sickle cell awareness and so it's very easy to reach out to them and talk with them and we do that they'll approach me and it's funny because uh, three or four of them said you know when this comes up i'd like to be involved in it so they are actually coming to me to say that they want to be involved which is really that certainly makes my job a lot easier. And when we were celebrating and speaking in the Senate about sickle cell awareness, for many years, I would be the only one to speak about it. Now I'm joined by others in the Senate, which is really wonderful. That's fantastic. Okay, folks, the poll is still live. So if you haven't had a chance to complete it, um, when it immediately launched, please do so. Your feedback and evaluation is greatly appreciated and it helps us course correct in the event we need to optimize these sessions. But with that, I'm going to, you know, unfortunately draw to a close this plenary session. The next session is going to start at 11 a.m. So we've essentially provided you with a 25 minute break, bio break, Please get hydrated, quick snack in because the day is still fun filled and jam packed with some more key insights like the one we received uh, during this session. So once again, thank you, Senator Jane Cordy, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ziad Sol, for that insightful presentation. We really appreciate your continued support and donation of time to Scago. Um, it's invaluable and it's it's so greatly appreciated. Thank you as well. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you. All right, folks, the break is good.